All right, awesome. So I want to welcome everybody here in person and online. And so it's good to be preaching again. I haven't, I've kind of almost forgotten how to preach. So we were on vacation and, you know, people were on vacation. Um, I, I will share a couple stories about vacation that'll just kind of lighten the mood up here. But uh, we, you know, we went with all, with uh, my family. We went with uh, John and Heather and their kids and mom and dad, me and Angie. And so we went to Gulf Shores and, uh, Anyway, one thing that was funny was uh, Lily, our, my four-year-old niece, she would call me, uh, she couldn't quite pronounce, get my name right every time. Instead of calling me Uncle Brian, she started calling me Uncle Biden. <clears throat> so I was known as Uncle Biden. And so anyway, Uncle Biden went to sleep one night. And so backstory, you remember, I don't know, about a month ago, when we had a snake in our garage. Remember that? I told you the story of the snake in our garage. Well, I probably suffer from a little bit of PTSD from that. I hate snakes. And so I'm always like jumpy now. You know, every time we open the garage door, we're like, okay, is there a snake in our garage now? But anyway, the place we were staying um, had a garage door and there was a crack in the garage door at the bottom of it about this big. And so my natural thought was, okay, well, a snake could easily creep in and slide under there. And if one of the kids were playing around and they left the door open to the house, they could easily get into the house. And that's kind of in the back of my mind. So Uncle Biden goes to bed. And so anyway, I, I go to bed. I, or I'm, I'm really extremely tired. I go to sleep. And Angie comes into my room. She says, hey, Lily wants to show you something. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm like half asleep right now. Um, but Lily wants to show you something. So I walk out. And Lily had found this uh, plastic snake, and she put this snake out into the hallway, and she's like, Uncle Biden, un Uncle Biden. And so immediately I screamed like a girl. It was like nine, I don't know, nine o'clock at night. I screamed like a girl. It was Angie, Anna, no, it was Angie, Caleb, Lily, and Heather. And then I screamed like a girl, and uh, they were just dying laughing for like five minutes, man. It was. Uh, yeah, Uncle Biden and his fear of snakes. I should write a children's book about that. So anyway, uh, that is where we have been up to. But I, you know, mentioned we went on vacation and last week we had home groups, didn't get a chance to, uh, I didn't get a chance to talk about Roe versus Wade, really wanted to talk about that today, really wanted to, this was on my heart that we really needed to celebrate what God did, a historic day for, to say the least. And I know there's, there's much ahead in this battle and this fight but for life, but um, I just think it's so important that we celebrate and thank God for what he did to even consider what is it that the Lord is speaking and what is it the Lord is saying. So I want to start today, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It's very, very important as I discuss this message that we come out of the natural mind, okay? We come out of the natural mind into God's mind. And Paul even talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that you have the mind of Christ. That is a dramatic statement, that you have the mind of Christ. And so here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I want to read that in, in, verse, in the last verse, verse 16, Paul says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. That is a dramatic statement. Now, one verse above that, listen, uh, or actually two verses above that, he says, he talks about the natural man in verse 14. The natural man, that word is soulish man. The soulish man, the, the person who operates out of their mind, their will, and their emotions. The person who operates out of their logical thinking and their, their mind is leading them rather than their spirit, he's what it says, that the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised, or I like to say spiritually discerned. And then he says in verse 15, the one who is spiritual discerns all things. And so my point in saying that is to have the mind of Christ in this day and hour that we live, to have his mind, to have his heart, to have his thoughts requires that we discern with our spirit what God is saying, what God is doing 
in this fight for life in our nation and not come into the carnal mind, not come into the soulless mind, not come into the talking points on the left or the talking points on the right, but come into the mind of Jesus Christ. Lord, what is it, Lord, you're saying about this Roe versus Wade case being overturned? It's truly historic. We want spiritual discernment. So I don't want to be like a political commentator today or a cultural commentator today or any of that. I want to truly say, okay, Lord, what is the heartbeat of Jesus for this, for what has just happened in this historic time? That's where I'm coming from. Lord, give us discernment. So June 24th, 2022, a historic day in our nation. I believe it was the most historic day in my lifetime. I'm 50. I believe there hasn't been something quite as dramatic as this since World War II, at least. That God answered the prayers of faithful intercessors who have prayed day and night, day and night, God end abortion, God send revival. They have cried out to God, according to Luke 17, that talks about that, that will not God give justice for his elect who cry out to him day and night. God has answered this prayer. Now, just to be clear, this case did not, over, did not make abortion illegal. It just sent the ruling back down to the states. But it was a massive victory for life. And I, I believe, as I'm going to show you, I believe God is on the move in this issue. I, I, believe, I believe that this is on the heart of God to really bring this nation into a, 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 pro, a life situation, that we would, we would stand for life. And as you probably know, since 1973, over 63 million babies have been aborted. 63 million babies. When you think about the population of our nation, 329 million people that means about almost 20% of our current population has been aborted. That is a greater holocaust than the Nazi holocaust under Hitler. 17 million people died under the holocaust under Hitler. 63 million in this abortion holocaust. It's a big deal. It is a really big deal. And so I want to give some insights of what I believe as I prayed about this, some insights into what I believe the, the Lord is wanting to speak into this situation. The first thing I want to say, I got 10 different things I want to say. Number one is we need to see abortion through God's eyes. We don't need to see it through the eyes of the left or the eyes of the right. We want to see it through the eyes of the one who is right, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so we need to see abortion through God's eyes. And I'll just start by sharing the story. I've, I've started to read, I, I really enjoy reading about near-death experiences. It sounds kind of morbid, but I really enjoy seeing, okay, what, what happens, you know, when you die? And what's like heaven like? What's hell like? And, you know, of course, I, I'm very skeptical about the different stories I hear. But I've, you know, one of the things I like to do is listen to different near-death experiences. And I found one that I, I really believe was a true near-death experience by uh, Jim Woodford. And I've got the link in the, in the YouTube link and the message link if you want to go back and watch his story or read his book. But he was telling the story. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but when he, when he died and went to heaven, he was shown heaven's nursery. And in Heaven's nursery, and he, he was like, I had no idea that Heaven even had a nursery. But in Heaven's nursery, all the babies who are aborted are sent into Heaven's nursery. And here in Heaven's nursery, now keep in mind, okay, keep in mind, this is not a prophetic experience. He died for, I think, six hours and spent six hours in Heaven. Came back into his body to the shock and the horror of his doctor's and lives to tell about us. This is not a prophetic experience to go, well, like maybe he just had a pizza or whatever. Um, no, this is actually, he died. He was clinically dead and he lived, he went to heaven for six hours. He's in heaven and he gets taken, shown around heaven and he sees heaven's nursery. And the angel told him that this is the nursery for souls of aborted babies. And so what happens basically is, according to his story, is that aborted babies go into this nursery where they are raised um, and groomed to mature. And they mature, he said, the angel told him, 
they, they mature at a rate of like three to one here. So in other words, if you're a two-year-old here on earth, or if, if you're a, if you're if you're a two-year-old on earth, it's about equivalent to being a six-year-old in heaven. You, it's a three to, I think it's a three-to-one ratio or something like that. Um, but basically, they're, they're groomed in the love of God, and they mature in the love of God. And then when they grow up to maturity, they're released back into the population of heaven. I was like, oh, man. That showed me God really cares about abortion. We, know, we, we obviously know that. But just to think... God has a special nursery in heaven where the aborted babies go and, and they're groomed and raised up to maturity. God really cares about abortion. Now, the other thing we know from Scripture, let's, let's turn to Proverbs verse 6, verse 16. Proverbs 6, 16, is we see that God, it, it talks about seven things God hates. Seven things God hates. So I want you to just feel the heart of God in this. Feel the heart of God in this, that, that he lays out six different things, seven different things that he hates. In verse 16, there are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Now note that these things are an abomination to the Lord. That means he, they are disgusting to him. He has extreme hatred in his heart for these seven things. I won't read all of them, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, but I want you to read this one. Hands that shed innocent blood. If ever there was blood that was shed of innocence, it's babies in the womb. When they're locked in the tomb and the tomb becomes a grave. That truly God hates the shedding of innocent blood. It's an abomination to God. It's an abomination to God that abortion Exist. And you know the scriptures in Psalms 139 that talks about that, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that even before we were in the womb, God knew us and God formed us and shaped us in the womb to be the people we are called to be. Second thing I'll say about abortion is abortion is child sacrifice to demons. Now, that makes some people feel uncomfortable, but it's very clear in Scripture. In fact, if you look at it in Leviticus, that the Israelites were going into, going into Canaan, and God told them, you shall, not, you shall not offer your sons and your daughters to Molech. See, Molech was a demonic god of Canaan, and, and this demonic god, the, the parents would take their children, and they would offer their children to Molech. And he was, and behind this idol, there was a demon. There were demons behind this idol that were receiving worship through child sacrifice. And God said, you shall not do this. And they were forbidden to do it. But just as there are demons behind Molech, I believe there are also demons that are behind the abortion industry. And that even as, as as America offers up their children to abortion, demons are being enthroned. Demons are being worshipped. So I'm saying is this ruling did a tremendous, uh, a, a tremendous victory in the heavens. It is a tremendous victory of, of cleansing in the heavens. Now I'm not saying it's over. It's far from over. What I'm saying is, is child sacrifice. It is child sacrifice to demons. Now I want you to read this scripture. Psalm 106, verse 35. Psalm, 130, Psalm 106, verse 35. Again, I want us to get on, on the Lord's heart, on the Lord's mind, so we can see the way he views things. The way he views things. That's the only thing that matters. The only thing that matters is the way God views things, not the way we view things. And so in verse 35, it says, they mingled with the nations. Talking about Israel. They're talking to some of the nation of Israel, how they played the harlot against God. They mingled with the nations. They learned their practices. They served their idols, Molech being one of the idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. And they shed innocent blood. 
the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. Now you might say, well, no, okay, I don't, I don't agree with you that these, pe these, these people are, are actually offering their babies to demons. I don't agree with you because they're not actually offering it up to Molech. These, these people are feeling like, you know, they're, they're feeling trapped. And I understand, they're, look, there's a whole side to this, a, a nuance to this debate. And, and you know, there, if, you've, if anyone's ever had an abortion, you know, God says there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus cleanses you from all of your sins, even the sin of abortion. So there is no condemnation whatsoever. But at the same time, the idols that we worship today are not the idols of Molech. They are the idols of convenience. They are the idols of my body, my choice. They are the idols of sexual perversion, sexual immorality, adultery. They are the idols that say, I want of selfishness. I want to live my life the way I want to live my life. And so behind every idol, first Corinthians makes this clear, behind every idol are demons. Behind the abortion industry are demons. And so when we offer, when America offers their children an abortion, we're offering them to demons. So the last 50 years, America has built an altar to Molech in this nation. And the fact that Roe versus Wade was overturned, I believe, is the beginning step of hopefully God uh, restoring this nation to some degree. Now, who knows how much that, that, what that looks like? We don't know. But it brings me to here, this third point. Our land has been polluted with blood. I mean, if you think about this, the blood of Abel cried out to God and God heard it. The blood of one man, what is it like when the blood of 63 million babies cry out to God? Trust me, God has heard the cry of the blood that has been shed in abortion in this nation. And he has answered the prayers of the saints. He has answered their prayers. But we have, in this nation, we have opened the gates of hell into this nation. And you wonder why all the insanity of what's going on, drag queen story hour with children and all the perversion, all the in incredible acts of sexual perversion that's going on. Why is this happening? We have opened the gates of hell by shedding the blood of our children. That's why. But God has stepped into this battle and answered the prayers of his people who have cried out, end abortion and send revival. God has done that. Amen. Number four, this is, this is what, the, the timing of this is so dramatic, is the overturn of Roe versus Wade took place in a jubilee year. So Roe versus Wade was decided on January 22nd, 1973. In Leviticus 25, if you read it, it says, after 49 years... In the 50th year, you are to proclaim a jubilee. Well, we are now, it hasn't been 50 years, but we are in the 50th year after the deciding of Roe versus Wade. You can't make that up. God is proclaiming a jubilee to the babies in the womb. God is proclaiming a jubilee to the babies who are like slaves trapped in the womb where the womb has become a tomb. And God has proclaimed to this nation, let my babies go. And he has done that on the year, on the, in the year of jubilee, the year of release, the year of freedom, the year when the slaves were released from captivity. God answers the prayers of his faithful intercessors who have cried out day and night for justice. And God answers with a year of jubilee. That is the mercy of God. That when we have the most pro-abortion administration in our nation's history who believes in infanticide, that God answers the prayers of his people during that time. Nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for God. God has acted. God has moved. The timing of this is incredible. 
If you think about it, we, we celebrated Juneteenth on June 19th when we celebrate the freedom of the slaves that, that first happened in Texas. We celebrate the freedom of slavery in Texas. Then, a few days later, Roe versus Wade is overturned. A, few, a week later, we're now the 4th of July when we celebrate the Declaration of Independence that all, that all people are created equal and all people are given, the, the, uh, given life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And now it's as if God is saying, I am now extending it to the least among you who have no voice in the womb. And I'm saying they deserve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The timing of this is dramatic. The timing of this is stunning. God has moved. God has acted. And I believe what slavery was for 200 and over 240 years, abortion has been for 49 years. It is the abortion, what slavery was in that time during the Civil War is what abortion is in this day. It's the very same thing. When they would say the slaves are not human and the argument says these babies are not human, it's the very same thing. We're, we're going to move into a time at some point, we're going to look back on abortion and we're going to look, everyone I believe is going to say the same way we view slavery today, we're going to view abortion uh, in that day. We're at the, we're at the cusp of, of, a, of an entirely new paradigm. God is on the move. God is moving to say, let my babies go free. So, I don't know if you remember, but on February 10th, I'm sure that's, I don't know, I, I'm sure you don't remember, but on February 10th, 2019, I preached a message called The Tipping Point. And I, I just want to read just what I said, and I've got it in the notes, and you can go back and read it. It's in the link to, on this message. I'm going to read what I said here just to make sure I get it right. As I said, the conditions of America are similar to the Hebrews in Egyptian captivity. Babies in the womb have been in captivity since 1973. Over, over the past 46 years, 60 million babies have been ab aborted. These voiceless and powerless humans made in the image of a holy God have been held in captivity. The womb has become a tomb. For 46 years, millions of intercessors have been crying out for liberation. Okay, now listen. As America's sin nears completion and the incense bowls reach a tipping point. By the way, we have reached that tipping point. The time is ripe for America's judgment. Okay? This ruling is, is judgment on America. Okay? Well, it's, you know, it's good news for us, but it's judgment on America. God has intervened for judgment. Our sins of abortion and sexual immorality have defiled the land, and judgment is inevitable. The father's cry to Planned Parenthood, our government, and the entire abortion industry is let my babies go. The Lord is about to release judgment upon darkness and evil while intending to release justice for the unborn. Amen. God has acted. Now again, there's a lot more to go, but God has acted. See, the year of Jubilee was a time when the Hebrew people had a reset. They had a reset to come back to their identity when the land and their economy and the slaves were all under this time of reset. I believe, if we have ears to hear, God has moved to offer this nation a reset. And I'm not talking about the great reset that's happening in Europe. I'm talking about a reset that America can go back to our founding fathers' dreams and visions of what this nation is meant to be. One nation under God. Again, I'm not saying we're going to be a theocracy, but I'm saying back to our founding fathers and their original intention. This is the opportunity for a reset. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm saying it is an opportunity for that to happen if we have ears to hear, if our nation has ears to hear. We have that opportunity for a reset. Number five is we have reached a tipping point in America. I, I, I truly believe right now the incense bowls, the prayers of the saints have been filled in heaven 
And those incense bowls are now being, have now been poured out and still are going to be being poured out. We have reached that tipping point. And I go back into this message I shared back in 2019. And I said that I believe that America has hit a tipping point in relation to sin and the prayers for awakening, the ending of abortion, and the bride to make herself ready. America has reached a tipping point. The sin of America is complete. Now, this, I, I preached this message, by the way, right after New York legalized infanticide. And I said the, the New York law legalizing infanticide drew a line in the sand. When the arrogant elite, this is what I declared, when the arrogant elite lit up World Trade Center pink to celebrate this abominable law, they crossed the line in God's eyes. They picked a fight with the Almighty. To make matters worse, they smiled as they legalized this. So they have picked a fight with God. At the same time, all of the prayer and the inter intercession to end abortion, send revival and make the bride ready has reached a tipping point. The incense bowls are filled. So now we have the convergence of America's sin, the need for judgment for, upon darkness, the cries of God's people for justice, that the powerless and the vo voiceless being murdered in the womb would be liberated. See, noble man used to say, we are living in a time of time, in a, seasons of, a season of seasons. And I believe that is what we are living in right now in this nation. This is a time of time and a season of seasons. It's truly a historic time. And I said here that, that when the Lord releases judgment, it is directed against darkness and injustice while at the same time bringing justice to the marginalized, oppressed, voiceless, and powerless. God's righteous judgment for America is a good thing because it will help to free those suffering. It is meant to liberate the unborn who are dying in the womb. So America has reached a tipping point and there's now no going back. We're not going back. That tipping point has been, has been reached. The Lord's judgment is about to intensify. This judgment is the answer to the prayers of God's people to save the babies, for awakening, for the bride to be made ready. It's going to be up to the American citizens if this coming uh, baptism of fire is going, to in, is going to result in the intended purpose to liberate the voiceless and the powerless in the womb. My point is this. Could we be at the point of a third great awakening? I don't know. I don't know. I hope so. I believe God has acted, but I don't know where it's going to go. I don't believe, I don't, I don't think anyone knows for sure where it's going, but we know God has intervened. We have reached that tipping point and God has sent the answer to our prayer. Now, again, the battle lies ahead for sure, but I'm saying God has acted and God has moved. So number six, it's important to remember the way the Lord moved to overturn this law. I'll be honest with you. Even though I, I, I said those things prophetically in 2019, I didn't have a lot of faith, just to be honest with you, that I would actually see the overturning of Roe versus Wade in my lifetime. And, you know, if you're being honest, you know, probably you didn't have that same amount of faith as well. I mean, it, to me, it was just like, wow, God actually did this. What we've been praying for for 50 years, not us, but, you know, the intercessors for 50 years, God moved. God moved. And so um, I just think it's so important that we remember the way God moved and we see nothing is impossible for God. This will give us great faith to stand in the place of prayer even when it seems as if our prayers are not being answered. Think about it. It goes all the way back to 2015. Donald Trump is running against Hillary Clinton. If Hillary Clinton, Clinton wins this election, Roe versus Wade would never have been overturned. But God moved, you know, no matter what you think about Trump, God moved. I don't, I don't believe there's any debate about that. God moved and did a miracle and put Donald Trump into office. Now, again, this does not mean I agree with every single thing he did. You know, I'm not going to get into all that. But Donald Trump appoints two pro-life judges. I'm not done. <laughs> you got ahead of the story. Two, he appoints two pro-life judges. 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a pro-choice judge, suddenly dies on September the 18th, 2020, the very same day Rosh Hashanah begins. You can't make that up. Fear God. Fear God. Some people want to complain, well, you're saying God took her out. I'm saying fear God. Fear the Lord. Reverence him. Fear the Lord. And then Trump appoints Amy Coney Barrett, a pro-life judge, as a third appointee to the Supreme Court. God moved. God moved. Truly a historic moment. Truly a miracle. God moved. I, I mean, I'm still just like in the most pro-abortion administration in our history. The Lord moves and does this. Number seven, this decision proves to the church that politics matter. Okay, I want to explain this carefully. This shows us that politics matter. Okay, there's a, there's a really big debate right now. You, you may know this, you may not know this, but there's a really big debate swirling around podcasts and social media and messages and blogs of how much Christians should be invo involved in politics. Some say, well, Christians should not be involved in politics at all because Jesus was not political, the apostles were not political, therefore we shouldn't be involved in politics because we don't want to uh, be a bad witness to someone, we don't want to polarize anyone and separate them. Our mission is to advance the kingdom and make disciples. Now, while I agree with that, and I, I trust, trust me, I, I understand that sentiment, and I, I fully agree we've got to be careful when it comes to speaking on political issues. We really do need to be careful that we're really speaking by the mind of the Holy Spirit, by the wisdom of God, and all that, and we can easily become political instead of influencing political decisions. But to me... This case shows us the church must be involved in influencing political decisions. Now, I agree with that, that eternity, where someone spends eternity, is far more important than whether or not our nation is blessed. Okay? Far more important than that. Making disciples, making the bride ready, everything dealing with God's eternal purpose is far more important than America and what goes on in our nation. However, that doesn't mean we should be silent. That doesn't mean we should not be involved in politics. That doesn't mean we should not intercede into political affairs. We're meant to be salt and light. Salt is meant to preserve decay. To, to, sorry, to preserve meat from going into decay. We're meant to preserve this culture from going into decay. We're meant to be that salt that, that preserves this nation from going off the deep end. And I mean, I think we're pretty close to that deep end if we haven't hit it yet. But we're meant to be salt in the culture. We're meant to be light that shines in the darkness. I mean, just imagine if William Wilberforce wasn't, wasn't engaged in politics, slavery would not have been overturned in England. I mean, just think about if Martin Luther King Jr. or, you know, you could go through a whole list of things. The church is meant to influence politics. So I believe that here's where I think the balance lies is the church is not meant to be political, the church, but the church is meant to influence political decisions. Now, as it pertains to us, not many of us, I don't think, are going to have a political voice. Our role is going to come in the place of prayer and intercession, in the place of standing in the gap. So we must be involved in praying into political decisions. So just to, just to say, and I also want to answer this, this question, that this claim that says Jesus was not political and the apostles, or, or Jesus did not speak into political issues and the apostles did not speak into political issues. Let me say this, is it's true that Jesus only spoke about paying taxes to Rome but Jesus was not called to Rome. Jesus was called to Israel. And in Israel, when the, when the leadership of Israel, the, the, the political and the religious were so tightly intertwined that he, when you spoke to the religious people, you were by default speaking into the political people. Because religion and politics in ancient Israel were, were absolutely intertwined. 
So to, to think like Jesus never spoke into political issues, when he overturned the tables, Jesus was not only speaking to religious issues, he was speaking into political issues. When Jesus, in Matthew 23, spent a whole chapter talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, he not only was talking into spiritual issues, but also political issues because they were so intertwined. And then to say that the apostles never spoke into political issues, Revelation, in Revelation 10, 11, John is given a commission, and, he, and the, the angel tells him, John, you are meant to prophesy yet again to nations, tribes, tongues, and to kings. And the prophetic history throughout Scripture is clear. Is John the Baptist, the greatest prophet ever born of a woman, spoke to Herod about his sin of adultery and he lost his head. Elijah confronted Jezebel and Ahab and said, you're uh, confronted them about their idolatry and their witchcraft. Um, we see Esther who stood in the gap and said, God, spare your people. They stood in the gap to the king and said, spare your people. These, this Haman has this wicked plot to destroy the Jewish people. And, and so, you know, just even reading the prophets, reading Isaiah, he always was speaking prophetically into political issues. So this idea that the church is not to speak into political issues does not stand up to Scripture. It is not scriptural to say that. Again, we got to be very careful that we don't get political. We got to be very careful that we speak by the Holy Spirit. We got to be very careful that we speak with wisdom, where we speak the truth with grace, we speak the truth in love, that we speak only what God tells us to speak when He tells us to speak. But silence at, at this time is itself evil. I will because it's my uh, eighth point. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> The church, number eight, the church must continue speaking into political issues. I love what Bonhoeffer said. Silence in the face of evil is evil, is, is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. You see, when we're silent, we're actually giving voice to something. And I just, I'll just be honest with you. I have been amazed at the silence of leadership in this nation. Yes, some, a remnant, have spoken out and praised God for the overturning of Roe versus Wade. But so many leading evangelical voices and worship leaders have been silent about this. And I'm sitting there going, how can you possibly be silent about this issue? How can you be silent about this? Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Silence in this time is in fact deafening. Silence is speaking. So the church must speak into, into political issues. And I, I, I would say it like this, whenever God's moral law intersects with political decisions, political issues, the church must be the conscience of the nation. The church must be that prophetic witness that speaks into those political issues of what God's moral law says. We cannot be silent. You know, the, um, Mordecai told Esther, do not be silent now. Do not be silent now. And yet the church, leadership, is silent about this issue. God help us. See, we cannot be silent as 63 million babies die in the womb. We cannot be silent as the LGBTQ activism works to groom our young children into their ideology. We cannot be silent in the face of perversion. We cannot be silent when God's moral law says one thing and political activism says another. We must be that prophetic voice that speaks into the conscience of this nation. Turn back to God. No matter what it costs us. It's not gonna, you're not going to win a popularity contest speaking out about these issues. Again... Only do it when the Lord says. Only do it in the timing of God, in the wisdom of God, in the way He wants you to say it, and how He wants you to say it. But we cannot be silent. We cannot be silent. 
Number nine is, is, this is a question, is will God make a distinction between pro-life and pro-choice states? I believe what we're entering into in this nation right now is very similar. Me and Larry were talking about this, and Larry was telling me before the service what God spoke to him, that he was, the Lord spoke to him that the states are kind of like right before the Civil War, where it's pro-slavery or anti-slavery. I was like, Larry, that's exactly one of my points in my message, so you can go home, and you already got the message. So, But I really do believe we're living in that very same time in this nation where it's coming down now to pro-choice and pro-life states. And it's, it's, it's going to bring a, a, a separation in this nation of pro-life and pro-choice. Ezekiel chapter 9, right before judgment came, God looked out and he said, okay, every single person who grieves over the abominations in the land, I want you to mark them. I want you to put a mark on them as they grieve over the abortions of the land. I want you to mark them because I am going to keep them from judgment. Could it be that if we grieve over the abomination of abortion, over the abomination of sexual perversion, over the abominations of this land, that God also would protect us? Could it be that if we don't grieve, that if we remain silent, perhaps... Perhaps we may not have that protection. I don't know. I'm not saying that for sure. I'm just saying perhaps. I don't want to find out the hard way. I want to grieve over what God grieves over, and I want to speak into what God wants me to speak into, into the conscience of this nation. See, in, in Amos chapter 4, 7 through 8, God tells the story that I am going to send rain on one city, but I'm going to withhold rain from another city. The Lord is basically saying this region, because of their sin, is going to experience my judgment. This region, because of their repentance and their righteousness, will be preserved from my judgment. I believe we are entering into a time in America when God is going to make that distinction between those who, who celebrate stand for or just remain neutral about these issues that grieve his heart. God perhaps could send his judgments on those who support this issue of abortion. While those states that stand for life that and say, not on my watch will we have this in our state. We are going to stand for life in America, in, in, in my state and in America. Is will God make that distinction. I believe that's what we're headed towards. I believe we are heading towards a time in our nation when those distinctions are going to become clear. That is why, number 10, our mandate to pray for Georgia has never been more important. I mean, never has it been more important. Now, if you're listening online and you don't live in Georgia, whatever state God has you in, you have a mandate to pray for your state now. It's never been like this before. We, now, obviously, we should have always been praying for our state. But never before has the ramifications been so important that if we don't stand for our state, if we don't stand for life, if we don't stand for the elections that determine life, then the blood could be on our hands. If we remain silent at this time, could the blood be on our hands? When God has moved in such a dramatic way and we are not interceding for life in the place God has assigned us to say, God, end abortion in Georgia, will he hold us accountable for that? I don't want to find out. I am going to do everything I can to say, God, preserve life in this state. Elections now in our state matter like never before. And some people have said, well, I don't vote just on pro-life, pro-abortion issues. I have, I'm a many-issue voter. Well, that made some sense before this. But if you're a Christian and you understand Scripture and you understand the polluting of the land with blood and you understand the opening of the gates of hell to demons and principalities... 
I don't think your argument stands up to Scripture. This is the number one issue for our nation. There's no other issue, in my opinion, like this issue of abortion. We have opened the floodgates of hell. We have polluted our land with our children's blood. Now God has moved. We must stand for pro-life uh, issues. We must stand for pro-life officials, representatives, governors, senators, congressmen, presidents, whatever. At every single level, pro-life, this pro-life issue matters of utmost importance. If, if you don't agree with that, I would highly encourage you to take that back to the Lord and humbly ask Him to get His opinion his opinion on it, not your own opinion, not my opinion, his opinion from his word the way he views it. Because if we don't stop the shedding of innocent blood, we're not going to have all the other issues. The floodgates of hell cannot be stopped if we don't stop the shedding of innocent blood. It opens the door to demons and principalities in this nation. So I want you to turn to Jeremiah 31, verse 15. This just hit me. And you remember that in 2015, Terry Bennett came and he had that encounter with the angel where the angel called us and summoned us. Does anyone remember that? No, I'm just kidding. You, you, we've talked about that so many times. But the angel called us and said, I'm summoning you to the golden altar. And, and um, one of the scripture verses that he gave us in this encounter was Jeremiah 31, 15. Now, I want you to understand this is a mandate, and I had never seen this until last week, until Roe versus Wade was overturned. Jeremiah 31, 15, thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Now, Matthew in chapter 2, verse 18, applied that to King Herod killing the babies that were two years and the younger. Here's what hit me all of a sudden last Friday or Saturday. That mandate, that golden altar prayer mandate, is a mandate to stand for life in the overturning of abortion in this state. Now, I know it has other ramifications to it that Dad's explained in his class, but that really just hit me. God is giving us a mandate to pray and to intercede for abortion to be overturned in Georgia. Now, as it stands right now, as I understand, is it the heartbeat bill, which was passed a few years ago, is going to hopefully go into effect soon, which means that, a, that a abortion is illegal after six weeks. I, don't, I, don't, I think that's correct, but I haven't actually researched it, but I think that's correct. But I, I, if you remember... The Lord, I can't remember all the details. I'm sure some people remember all the details. But a few years ago, the Lord really came into our prayer time. We weren't even thinking about this, but the Lord really came into our prayer time. And we began praying for abortion. And we began to pray for this issue. And almost without even realizing it, this heartbeat bill was uh, about to be determined and was in, you know, in motion in Georgia. And through our prayers, and I'm sure through many other prayers, this heartbeat bill was passed and so God really used us as intercessors to stand in the gap for Georgia. But now that the issue has come down to the states, I'm telling you, our prayer times on Wednesday and Thursday are of uh, once a month, or of, uh, and then the other uh, Wednesday, the other uh, second Wednesday in the month, are of utmost importance. Of utmost importance. We are, we are standing for life in this state. And our elected officials are going to determine whether, whether the land in Georgia is polluted with blood or not. We have a mandate to stand in the gap for life for this state, that this state would remain a pro-life state. History belongs to the intercessor. History belongs to the intercessor. The fate of this state belongs to the intercessor. We will win the battle in our intercession, and our state will experience the blessings and the victory if we will remain faithful in the place of prayer. So this is a call and a mandate 
to pray for our state, to pray for our elections, to pray because it all comes down to life or death, bloodshed or life, is that we cannot be silent now. We cannot abdicate our role for prayer and intercession. We must stand in the gap for life. Amen. Amen. What we're going to do, and, and we're going to even, we'll stay online for this portion, is if you're watching online, if you want to join in with us, we're going to take communion now. And so if you're watching online, if you want to go and get your communion elements, I want to encourage you to do that. And uh, we're going to go ahead and, Randall, you want to, Go ahead and pass the communion elements around. Just good news is we got rid of those whatever styrofoam bread type things we had before and that fermented grape juice or whatever. It was just nasty. This is actually uh, much better. But we're going to take communion right now around this issue of thanking God for the blood of Jesus Christ. There is a greater blood, and it's the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood, thank you, Randall. The blood of Jesus Christ speaks louder than the blood of Abel. The blood of Jesus Christ speaks louder than the blood of 63 million aborted babies. The precious shed blood of Jesus Christ is the victory. And so we're going we're gonna to take communion around this theme and just thank God for what he did. Stay in a, that was a music background music, just stay in a kind of a silent mode. We just say right now, Jesus said, this is my body, which was broken for you. When we take communion, when we take this bread, this bread that symbolizes the body of Christ, it brings us into the experience of his body. It brings us into the experience of his death. When we in the body of Christ died with him, when we in the body of Christ died to sin, died to self, died to the law, when we were crucified with Christ, this symbolic bread takes us into that experience of his presence where we have that fellowship with his body and that fellowship with his blood. So take eat of this bread. Jesus said, this is my blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of sins. This is the blood of the new covenant. 
as we drink this juice symbolic of the blood of Jesus Christ. His blood overcame the devil. His blood overcame every sin. His blood overcame even the sin of abortion. The blood, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. When you, when you drink this juice, you're coming into the participation of his blood. You're coming into fellowship with what his blood does. His blood cleanses you. His blood gives you victory over the devil. His blood silences your conscience. His blood silences all the accusations of the in in enemy. His blood justifies you. His blood frees you from the wrath of God. Take drink of this blood, the blood of Jesus. Now what I want us to do is we're gonna have a moment of silence for the 63 million babies who were aborted. As my flesh wants to do it in one minute, but I feel like we need to have five minutes of silence. Just to remember to remember those who've been aborted.
What I want us to do now <clears throat> is I believe God is wanting to challenge us to take a vow to stand for the issue of life in this state. If you're listening online in your state, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or stand up or anything like that, but if you witness with that, and if that's something that's on your heart to do, just let the Lord know in however way you want to let him know that you are, you are making a vow, you are committing yourself to stand for life above all in the place of prayer and intercession. So just take a minute right now and just speak that to the Lord. What I want us to do now, as many of you know Lou Engle, who, in my opinion, has been one of the most faithful voices for pro-life. I know we had a group of people went up to Nashville in 2007 on 7707. Who, who all went to that? I know we had a group of people that went to that, and I think they gathered I don't know, 70,000 people, and, and one of the, the things was fasting and praying to end abortion, and, you know, Lou Engle has really just, in, in a couple of different ways, has really impacted our life. I won't go into the details of that, but he made famous this prayer. I'm going to ask Quentin to put that up there. <clears throat> I want us to just stand right now, and let's pray this prayer together. We'll pray it at least three times. He made famous this prayer. I just want to, I just want to pray it just because I, I want to, in, in some small way, honor him. He has been unbelievably faithful to standing up for pro-life for, for, for many years, fasting 40 days, 40 nights, calling out, just constantly calling out, God, end abortion, send revival. So let's, let's pray this together. Jesus, repeat after me, Jesus. I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation. God, end abortion, send revival to America. Jesus, I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation. God, end abortion and send revival in America. Jesus, I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation. God, end abortion and send revival to America. One more time. Jesus, I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation. God, end abortion and send revival to America. Randall, would you come on up and blow the shofar? Remember the, the year of Jubilee was marked by a trumpet blast that proclaimed to the slaves let, uh, that you might go free, you might be released. And as, we, as Randall blows this shofar as a trumpet blast, we are proclaiming to those in the womb that you may be released from the womb, that you, they will not become a tomb. Let God's babies go free. And so when he's done blowing that trumpet, we're going to shout, and then we're going to just shout out to God with our voices.
Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we end this and we say, Jesus, we plead your blood. We just say, Jesus, we plead your blood over our sins and the sins of our nation. God, end abortion and send revival to America. Jesus, we plead your blood over our sins and the sins of our nation. God, end abortion and send revival to America. Jesus, I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation. God, end abortion and send revival to America. One more time. Jesus, I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation. God, end abortion and send revival to America. And we say yes and amen in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. Yes, Lord. Amen. We're going to end the online portion now. Thank you so much.